Hello, everybody. I think we are live. Um, I'm Anna Vassiri. I'm talking to you from sunny Glasgow in Scotland. And uh, today we have uh, three fantastic panelists to talk about early career development um, and see what we can actually do to make sure that our future career is more successful than um, we might have done it before. So, um, as I said, uh, we have three fantastic panelists. To be honest, I'm pretty sure I won't be a good, uh, fair introduction. So I'm going through the detail of uh, their name and job title, and it would be nice for them to tell us how they end up where they are at the moment. So we go through the question. Uh, before we start, I just want to encourage uh, you to type your question in the question and answer box because we have a good plan for the first half of this session. But after that, I actually want to read your question and ask the panelists to answer that. I'm really excited to hear from them. I'm sure you are the same. So can I start with Nadine to tell us a little about herself? Yes. Thank you, Anna, for organizing this. It's very exciting. And hi, everybody. Yes, please type your questions. So we learn too, I think, uh, via these interactions. So uh, I'm Manedine Alame. I'm uh, the CEO of the Open Geospatial Consortium, OGC, which hopefully if you're doing spatial data science or geospatial or geography, uh, you've heard of us, but uh, we're known for the standards for accessing and finding geospatial information. And uh, we're a global organization, uh, not for profit. We have the Googles and the Apples of the world and the Esri and the Hexagon and the NASA and the ESA and literally everybody. So, um, uh, what we do is try to make geospatial information findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Now, how did I get here? <laughs> Just to answer Anna's question. So I, I actually did uh, computer engineering, actually computer and telecom engineering in undergrad. And um, I was one of the top students in my class and I got a scholarship to go to MIT to study in the urban studies and planning department, GIS. So I had no clue what GIS is, but I definitely knew what MIT is because I was coming from Lebanon where, you know, this is a dream. And that's how I got into the whole geo. And I think part of it is as soon as you find what geo is and what it can do, all of a sudden, you know, all these neurons open up in your brains because it's visualization, it's analysis. And my favorite part, it's not one thing. So it, uh, you do the databases. I went to NASA and did Earth observation and remote sensing analysis. You go to aviation and you do air traffic control with geospatial. I mean, right now we're doing digital twins and metaverse. So it's like, I think it's the best, uh, I say it's the best thing to do if you're, you're afraid of commitment <laughs> because it opens all sorts of doors. So. I'll start there, and I'm sure we'll we'll talk a little bit more uh, as we go. Uh, thank you very thank much, Nat. That's really exciting. Harry, can we go to you next? Sure. Um, can you can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, so, in many ways, I'm an early career. I'm in my early career too. I'm not very um, experienced. Uh, so, I am the CEO of Owner Labs and founder of Owner Labs. I'm also an associate research scientist at Northeastern University, so I play dual role both on academic side and in industry side. Um, so my background uh, has been in geoinformatics and spatial informatics for a long time. So I did my undergrad in geoinformatics, master's in spatial informatics, and PhD in spatial informatics. Um, and presently, uh, Owner Labs is Universal Accessibility Research Lab, where uh, we focus on a slightly different aspect, right? So when you think about spatial science or spatial data science, we always think about visualization, data, and analysis. Uh, but at the company, we think about how do we make all this visualization accessible to people who cannot see the visualization. So the primary goal of the company is to make information accessible to blind and visually impaired people, uh, specifically spatial information accessible to blind and visually impaired people using touch, audio, and kinesthetic feedback. And 
they are the primary target but you can imagine uh, the applicability for anybody like you can you don't have to always rely on visuals uh, there are other mechanisms and technologies and modalities that you can access information and use information like audio natural language kinesthetic feedback and what not uh, so that has been the primary focus on the company side and then on the academic side i i do explore uh, more on the multi sensory information access with a particular focus on how do we bring that spatial knowledge into the traditional uh, points line polygon access in in different manner um, So I guess I'll stop there, and I'm pretty sure we'll we'll dive deeper into many of those ideas as we talk more. Definitely, yeah. Thank you very much, Harry. That sounds really exciting. And let's go to Vanessa. Um, tell us a little about yourself, where you get, where you are. Hello, everyone. I am a lecturer in spatial data science at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. I actually just moved here four months ago. I'm originally from Brazil, so <laughs> quite far. Uh, I did my undergrad in geography in Brazil, and I decided to pursue geography because I always really liked maps, so a bit different there. And then after that, like I fell in love with remote sensing, so went towards like Earth observation, got my master of science in that, and then I moved to Scotland to get a PhD in geoinformatics at the University of St Andrews. So I. graduated um December 2018 so i'm like at the end of the early careerish kind of five years period and after that i did a postdoc at Arizona State University another postdoc at the University of St Andrews and the last postdoc at the Wrocław University of Life and Environmental Sciences in Poland and moved here and my research is using spatial data science for like transport planning like applied research that's the focus I'll stop there for Thank now. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to point out how diverse our panelists are from different level of career. You of course we've got um, Nadine who uh, I would say very established um, um a researcher but also we have got Vanessa and Harry who identified themselves within that earlier stage but also i just wanted to point out from ge- geography you know just spatial diversity is also great i know it sounds very selfish that i'm based here in the uk that's a very decent time for me but we've got Nadine and Harry based in the us and Vanessa in new zealand so basically we've got the two other side of the planet bringing together and i think we have uh ticked the box of diversity if um we need to have more male candidate on a panel in any conference that is related to data science and um ai so um well done us i just wanted to say that so yeah. let's start with um some questions um that we have prepared as i said all the candidates can be um contacted by all of you um via our question and answer um box here so please put your question and answer uh they come from different sector as you see from SME from academia from OGC so uh, it would be good to hear their views but let me start with the first one if you consider someone to be successful in your sector what are the top 3 skills that you think are going to be the most important for their career and i would appreciate if you don't do not repeat the other one's answer even if you think that's the most important one so let us start with harry who is taking care of his company now so can you tell us a little about those top 3 skills sure um so again i can probably answer this in both aspects right one on the company side one on the academic side um so in many ways academic side success has been pretty established like so if you're a tenure track uh faculty your success relies on getting the tenure and doing important research that makes an impact in real world uh but how do you get to that point is is different for different people depending on where you are right uh but at least in the academic side you have a clear way of going towards the target so your your uh, curriculum your metric evaluation system kind of guides you to to publish papers to guide students and or not but if you come out of that traditional realm and thinking like the business world or in like the job market it's very different um so success um to me at least it's it's more impact driven so so i started on a labs primarily to make impact in a, in the real world uh, especially based on my observations uh, of blind and visually impaired people i wanted to make some impact in their world uh, providing them access to visual information that is 
traditionally been not provided to them right so uh, in that sense i'm still a long way away from making that happen uh, both because of technological challenges funding challenges and um, actual implementation challenges and what not uh, so success um, is is a slow process in many ways it's sometimes it it happens quickly sometimes it it takes time and perseverance um so i don't know i'm i'm kind of losing my train of thoughts here but um as i said i'm i'm also an early stage so um it's very hard for me to make advice or provide some suggestions here uh, but i can tell you what i did so far um rather than saying what should have been the case for many people um so for me uh, the motivation drove me to start the company right so uh, after phd during my phd i did a lot of research with blind and visually impaired people uh, i understood their problems i saw what was happening in real world i was traveling across the country to visit different blind and visually impaired institutions and then looking at the problems they face it motivated me to take the traditional research to a different level and make products and solutions rather than just doing research and applied research with that right so i had i always had that option to do more research and leave it as an academic paper versus building a product out of it um so i chose this different path because i realized actually making a product would make more impact than just reading about it and writing about it um so that's kind of the pusher for me to start the company and once i started the company i started noticing all the other problems that comes with it right so it's not just me doing research and and providing a paper it's it's a whole another game i need to bring in people i need to bring in funding so so the challenges changed quickly from doing research to actually raising funds and uh and understanding that challenges and facing those challenges is kind of an experience for me Uh, and and learning like what needs to happen for writing a grant proposal what needs to happen to talk to an investor to invest in the company and, and so for you have raised 2 million dollars in r&d funding but that didn't come easy so it it took time and perseverance for 4 years to get to that point yeah um, okay that's interesting i think uh, what i hear from uh, what you described first of all is a bit of perseverance because the challenge changes all the time so that perhaps yeah. is one of the skills that, that you need to work on and develop yes. um if you want to develop a company for yourself and start a, a, an SME but also a, a bit of adaptation because again the landscape changes your motivation might change so i know that i um well we have different level but nadine you might have a bit of a, a better insight in terms of people who are developing their own business or also um a research career could you tell us a little about the three top skills that you think might be very helpful to be a successful spatial data scientist here um so as harry was talking i was like you know noting down cuz you said we shouldn't repeat what they said and harry did a great job so <laughs> he made it harder for us but no so on the serious side i think uh i mean you can come at this from different angle but i i like my angle because like the because um if you have a strong foundation in technology so this is where I'm, you know so if if you actually are strong in the technology and you have this curiosity right so what harry did is like i want to solve this problem i don't want to just talk about it i want to actually solve it so if you have the technology then all of a sudden anybody that comes to you as with a problem you go oh i can help you because we can do this and oh look i can help you so it's like strong technical foundation in everything related to geo so it's a, you know it's it's a, to me it's a little bit of a lot is actually adds up to make you a unique you know contributor i think to society this curiosity um so that you so when a new technology comes in right now, internet of things you go you know you figure it out because it connects to um, to to your foundation right so it helps you grow very quickly and this combination that you see in harry which is again goes back to a little bit of a lot a little bit of business and a little bit of technology and a little bit of social skills and maybe the social skills nobody told me about the social skills as a communication and we find ourselves spending most of our time communicating and i think as technical people sometimes you're like it's obvious to you it's like but of course i can do this and that and look but 
you have to repeat it. You have to make it in a way that other people understand the value and the impact so that they would invest in people like Harry. They would invest in your research. So I think this combination of technology, keep up with the technology, and that's not because it's a homework. It's because you are curious, right? And this, uh, this uh, curiosity, this passion to helping others, and then, you know, communication as a very important skill. Yeah, that, that's very, very important, especially when, when Harry was saying about um, impact. You know, if you want to actually have an impact, you really need a bit of all three that use that. Vanessa, you, um, you are in academia. How do you see the, the success um, secret uh, so for your uh, sector? Um, I think of success as being where you planned or want to be at a certain point in time and space because I think it's something really, really personal. So nowadays I feel successful because my plan was to be in a academia and be a, like a, a lecturer, become research. But that said, I, I made a list of a few skills that I think were crucial and like are really important. So the first one is definitely in any job, time management skills. Because if you don't plan and you don't make it happen, like it won't happen just because you decide it's going to happen five minutes before the deadline. So time management was really, really key for me to like finish my PhD on time and at the same time manage to put proposals for postdocs and fellowships. And you know, I didn't have a month in between where I didn't have a job because I always planned at least six months in advance. Of course, it's not a hundred percent always possible, but you can try your best to fill the gaps, those gaps. Uh, another one that I really think is crucial is like learning to say no, but also learning how to say no. Because particularly when you start at a new institution, if people come and try to collaborate with you and you might not really be that much into the topic they want to collaborate with you and you just say like, no, you just shut the door permanently and they will never ask. And that's not what you want because you don't want to end up isolated. So you say like, that sounds like a good idea. We can talk more about that. In my experience, 80% of the time, they will never ever mention again. And if they do, you go and actually try to understand and see how you can make that work without like shutting doors and getting isolated. Um, the other thing that kind of ties into that, like people management skills. Like I feel like, I am in a really nice department, but still I'm a very sociable person. And for me, most of the first months is actually understanding all the dynamics that go on and like how those play in our jobs. And like as scientists and as like technical people, we often totally ignore that. And like, I can tell you, that's a mistake. <laughs> Don't do that. So I really recommend you try to understand where you are arriving the people that are there their motivations for any case and like particularly the ones you want to collaborate with and um the two last before anna just says stop it <laughs> it's like uh i always had this thing of like going beyond what was asked from me uh as a as a postdoc mostly because i was driven by my curiosity and so I, I wasn't really waiting for my supervisor to solve everything or come up with all the ideas. I would go to them with ideas and even go to researchers that were not my supervisors. Like I emailed them at once saying like, I want to do a fellowship in Glasgow. How do I write a project? That kind of thing. Just like go and try the no. You already have the no. And the last one is like learning and understanding your needs because that goes in balance with going beyond what is asked. Because if you just go beyond what is asked all the time, you might end up getting like a burnout and being not productive at all. And like, this is really bad. But if you learn what you need, you, you kind of learn how to balance this like high productivity peak. And then sometimes like there are days I can work until 8 p.m. and I'm happy about that. But there are days that like it's 3 p.m. and like I know my brain is done. And I learned with time to accept that because I know in the end, they all kind of like, you know, so I think those are the main ones. I don't know. Thank you. That That's great. To be honest, I think some of them linked to the previously mentioned, but I'm going to 
you know, slide that over. For example, um, that curiosity driven, I think um, that, that brings uh, both um, Nadine's and Harry's comment about, um, you know, you need to have curiosity, adapt to your motivation and so on. But I really like your comment about say no more. Um, one time a wise man told me that you need to say more yes to be asked and be able to say no uh, more often. Because if you keep saying no, then people will stop asking. But if you keep saying yes, um, you know, at some point you burn out. But but there should be a balance. And that's a really big, big skill to, to have um, both. So we should say yes more often to be able to say no more often. Um, okay, so I know we picked three very successful panelists. Um, whether you um, say it or not, I think at where you are, as Vanessa said, um, we believe you are very, very successful. But can I ask one question about the mistake that you've done or something that you regret or you would have done it differently or you wouldn't do it at all? Something that you would say during my career, this would be the thing that I wouldn't do it in the same way that I did it. And if you tell us why, um, then that would be very helpful. So can we start with Vanessa? We we'll start with you. Well, for me, it's definitely uh, overthinking and stressing over things I had no control over because I was overthinking them. <laughs> it's like I would apply for a job and would be like dreading for months. Like, will I get it? Will I not get it? Like, it was out of my hands. I had no control over it. Or I would submit a paper and then like just be super and nowadays it's like i submit and forget about it until i get grumpy about the reviews <laughs> back but i think it's definitely like stressing over things i could not control and it's just really a skill to master to actually understand like you did all you could up to that point and beyond that for that specific thing there is nothing else so just let it go you know and that drains a lot of energy if you're not careful we just yeah that's what okay. i would change yeah what about you harry is there anything that you would say oh that's a bit of a mistake i've done um yeah there are a lot of mistakes i've done for sure um <laughs> Uh, <laughs> professionally speaking um so i'd say uh, i can definitely say two things so one is um i should have I definitely undervalued networks or networking specifically. Like we are definitely, I should have been more social uh, in the professional network experience. Like, so despite having a lot of opportunity, I was more focused towards what I was doing and I was trying to run towards getting my paper done or meeting, getting my research done and doing things that way rather than actually building more networks when I had the opportunity. But um, it, it was too late when I realized the value of networking. Uh, so I would definitely change that if, if I'm going back a uh, few few years in my career, I would definitely focus more on networking rather than just presenting paper or talking to people with the research aspect as opposed to the applied aspect. And the so second I'm major mistake is, yeah, um, is again going back to Vanessa's point on saying no. Uh, so there were definitely points in, in the business world and in the academic world um, when you have good ideas, good technology, people will quickly say, oh, can you solve this problem for us? Can you solve this problem for us? And with, with that initial excitement, I also said yes to many people. And then I realized I'm kind of going in every direction, but I'm not moving at all. And that took me some time to realize I shouldn't say yes to everything. I should maybe start saying going in one direction and then take deviation to different paths. Um, so that's a learning I, I did. So, and then transitioning from that diverse focus to streamlined focus on one problem area and one solution area took, took some time. So I would change that definitely. Okay, thank you very much. I think that that's very useful. So our audience may not repeat the same mistake that we have done um, um, in our career, so that, that's beneficial. Nadine, how do you describe the biggest regret that you have for your career development? So first of all, I have to say how impressed I am with Vanessa and Harry. You are so mature <laughs> for, for when I feel like we were all over the place. Uh, so it, it makes me so, so happy. Uh, I wish my kids were, you know, can actually listen to this because it has nothing to do with spatial data science. It's about, you know, people and how they grow and they become, you know, amazing people like you are. Uh, so I'm very, like, I'm very impressed. Um, 
my thing is I don't like the word mistake. Um, so I grew up during the war and my philosophy has always been, if it's not life and death, it's going to be okay. Right. So, uh, and in this case, the mistake, and that's what I tell my kids, unless, you know, life and death and drugs, right. <laughs> uh, it's a learning experience. Right. And yes, in the moment it's, you know, the world is ending and everything, but actually when you look back, you see that you became you because of quote unquote, these mistakes. It's like these experiences really. So, uh, so no regrets. I, I literally, I never, I always, I've always said never ever regret because the decision is a decision. You own it. You just go, um, takes you to Australia, New Zealand. <laughs> it's an adventure, right? And that's what life is all about. Um, but a lesson learned for me over and over again, and I have to remind myself and I have to tell people close to me to remind me, trust your instinct. I think over and over again, uh, like I think Vanessa said, it's not just overanalyzing. It's just like, you know, you feel it in your gut. I have to change jobs or I have to move to some other place. And then you just get stuck there. Um, and over and over again, when I look back, your instinct was right. And sometimes it's even like if you need to fire somebody or you need to hire somebody, right? And then you start to put criteria and whatever. It never works out if <laughs> your instinct is usually right and it gets better over time. So I would say my, my lesson learned is trust your instinct. It's not you, you, you are a business owner or you're a researcher or you're a member of a team because you deserve to be there. You earn the right to be there. People trust you. So your instinct actually can help you in, in these moments of decisions, sometimes really tough decisions. Thank you very much. I think that that's a very good point. First of all, um, that's useful term to use, um, lessons learned, because uh, even if you making mistakes is a part of the, the success you know we learn we go back then we don't make the same sort of mistake or learn some lessons and go forward so that that's a very good point uh, but also the second point um i think we, we've got a big uh, famous sentence that says um you know ask for um forgiveness more often than uh, permission it's basically to try to tell you that um you know you can you know try and uh, try your um, trust your own instinct. If anything goes wrong, then people forgive you. But, you know, um, it's better to just trust yourself. Um, OK, so I think we are halfway through our session uh, and we have so many good questions. So I'm going to start with them. We still have got some questions that we um, that I thought might be useful, but I'm going to give the um, priority to our audience. So the first question is the role of commitment and hard work. Um, what do you think? You know, of course, um, the success is um, a very complex thing and your definition of success might be different, but um, it's usually require a, a lot of hard work and uh, commitment. Um, at some point, um, we may let something go just because, you know, it may not have uh, that much of a force. But how do you um, see the level of commitment in your success, in your career? And um, ideally, you can compare it between academia, industry, in different parts of the world that you are. Can we start with Nadine? This time? Um, yeah, I, so thank you, Johannes, for this uh, question. That's very deep. It's actually very deep because, uh, first of all, success. I think Vanessa hinted at this earlier. To me, success is, like she said, it's personal. To me, it's a feeling, right? It's not uh, based on criteria. It's like, I feel successful because I did something I set up to do and I achieved it. And I'm helping others and I feel good. Right. And that's that's success. So it's hard to sometimes measure uh, the hard work. Thank you, Johannes, because my my thing that I again, I tell my kids they don't listen. So but <laughs> I try. <laughs> um, uh, I always tell them and because I've I've experienced it many times, every time hard work never goes to waste. Never. Right. 
if you put your heart into something, it may, your business may end up failing and your project may end up failing or your, you know, your marriage may end up failing. It doesn't matter, right? But it actually doesn't go to waste. It, it materializes somehow, again, down the road because you've, you've accumulated a series of either technical skills or social skills or business skills. So to me, hard work, always pays off it may not pay off the way you want right but it actually eventually always pays off if it's coming you know this is not some somebody's forcing you to do hard work it's not you know grudgingly but if you're passionate it will find itself somewhere and that's i think that's why success becomes a feeling because it all comes together uh the commitment i think um you know if you look at my career um it's uh it, it's i don't know if it's like a it's a commitment almost to being better and having more impact and not necessarily in one thing and one thing only so i think there are also various manifestations i think of commitment commitment to helping others and always getting better absolutely couple that with hard work then you definitely feel successful whether anywhere whether it's an academia or business or not for profit. Okay, thank you very much. I think um, I just want to link it to another question that Johannes also said that is very related to uh, what you um, mentioned is about, for example, success rate of some of the funding and, you know, generally for anything that we do. Um, and what you said about hard work never uh, be wasted. Um, you know, I, I remember one of my good colleagues um, sometimes um, when I was complaining about the success rate and rejection in grant application or papers and so on, he said, well, it is competitive. It is going to have low success rate if we say success is getting and winning. But if you don't apply, first of all, the success rate is zero. Secondly, you will never learn. Um, so that helped to develop your, for example, proposal or paper or so. So um, Harry, what do you say? Because the original question was actually to you about the commitment um, and hard work that um, was there. But also that would be good to mention a little about your funding because you, you raised funding for your business. Yeah, um, so I'd like to echo both Vanessa and Nadine's point on success, right? It's success is, is a feeling and it's always a moving target depending on where you are and what you're doing, right? So it, it never stops. So just because you got the funding doesn't mean you succeeded. You still have a new success metric to meet after that, right? So it's it's always a never-ending process or moving target that you'll run towards. Um, it's it's not one and done. So, so I would say, at least I don't think of uh, funding or meeting a deadline or meeting a milestone as success. For me, success is more impact driven, right? So for me, success is seeing an actual user getting things done based on what I did, right? So using my technology to solve a problem that they are facing currently. So that is success for me, as opposed to actually getting a funding or finishing a project, right? So, uh, so measuring that is individualized, right? So how do you measure your own success has to be very different. So in many cases, um, even before this, one of the jobs I had was to be a technical uh, support executive for one of the antivirus products companies. So I was uh, on telephone calls talking to customers. So if I'm, so I'll be having like 50 calls in a day, and some calls I won't be able to solve. Some calls I will be able to solve their problem. So success in that case was um, solving people's problem. Uh, making them use their computer that day made me happy, right? So that's the success metric I had for that day. So do not overemphasis on the factor of success because it's very different for what you're doing in different times. Uh, going back to the other two points, commitments and perseverance is very important in anything that we do. Um, but hard work, I, I slightly have a different opinion, right? So for me, it's better to do smart work than hard work. Um, it's it's about planning, right? So in in the startup world, if you if you look at many of the startups, there's this common um, ideology that if you're not putting hundred hours in a week, then you are not in startup. So that's what people think, right? So anybody in startup tend to put like hundred to hundred and twenty hours a week, uh, just banging their head into the monitor, thinking about different things, trying to do so many things. Uh, but if you plan it right, if you do it right, you don't have to put hundred hours. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, but Keeping that as 
the metric to say that you're doing things right is also wrong, right? So just because you're in startup doesn't mean you always have to do hard work, right? So hard work is associated with the time you put and the amount of effort you put on certain things, right? Uh, it can be the physical labor or the mental labor, but for me, doing things smart is more important than doing things hard. Um, and that is applicable in both area, right? Whether it's academic or in the startup world. Um, okay. Thank you. I, I think that that's a very good point. I just wanted to look at it from another angle. Maybe Vanessa can um, have, although that's a follow up to what Harry and Nadine said. Well, of course, success is a feeling that we have. But at some point, we are being measured against some of the criteria that is set by institutions. And also to be successful and feel very good. You know, there are little steps that we need to take. And these are some of the things that are perhaps designed by someone else. For example, if I want to have a very good feeling and serve the customers or uh, have a good feedback from my students or research community, I need to have some input to have some time to do that. That means I need some funding. That is a little success. I don't mean that necessarily translate to make you a successful person. That's not necessarily that direction, but you need that little teeny tiny successful uh, moment to be able to, for example, fund your research or. So how do you see that? Is that a conflict because our institution, our university, this is something that also mentioned in one of the question that, well, basically our institution, university, society put some criteria. Although some of them are ridiculously you know, unrelated to success, but still we are being measured against that because it is very, very competitive world and the resources are limited. So there should be some sort of measures that we define to evaluate people to be able to allocate resources. So can we start with you, Vanessa, then go to Nadine and Harry to respond to that sort of conflict between our feeling of successful and the, the measures of success that is imposed to us? Yeah, I think that's a very good point and it is something I still do. I, like every time I have to apply for a grant or submit a paper or something, I feel very strong about because you need to face that like challenge. But I try to think about it from the perspective, like if I apply for a grant or if I submit the paper, someone has to get that grant. Someone has to publish a paper in that edition. So I always try to think it from the perspective of like, why not me? Someone has to do it. So I will try. Um, about the metrics itself, I might have a bit of a like different view. I agree with you that we are like measured by this objective criteria that are not always that objective and even are not completely fair when you compare different research areas across the same faculty or the university. So there is the other thing, but we have to deal with them. And the way I've been dealing with it so far is like, I always compare the criteria that is being brought to the table, that they are bringing to the table and what and where that will get me. And if I'm willing to pay the price, that's basically what I do. Like a clear example is the other day I was discussing with a few friends about like when you reach a certain level at some universities, if you want to progress, you have to take on this really big admin role, which basically means you do no research and you'll be just doing admin. And I was like, well, at that point in my career, I will probably be making enough money that like, yeah, I'm not willing, so I will not progress. And they were like, but don't you want to get to the top? I was like, well, everyone gets wants to get to the top of like the, the pay scale and the career, but that's a price today I'm not willing to pay. I might change. So that's the kind of exercise I try to do when I'm thinking about this set criteria that we have to achieve and how I can like think about it so that it makes sense to me. Some criteria might not make sense and you still have to comply. <laughs> and then what you do, it is a job. So you do what you have to do. That's how I, I try to deal with it, really. Okay. Um, that, that sounds good. Can I you want to answer? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, no, I, uh, this is amazing. I think, uh, uh, thank you for the comment, Christophe, uh, as well, because I think 
um, what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing these days, and it's not just academia, it's also business. And I think it feels like it's our society. We're all have becoming very short term, right? So when I look at grants, at funding, at you know investment, everybody's like, so what's the ROI in six months? It's like, I can't change the world in six months. And that's what we're trying to do here. And I hear it a lot. So I think your comment, Christophe, Maybe we need to raise it, that also the criteria has to evolve with the time. So what I hear, for example, that there are no, you know, we do these grants and these projects six months, one year, two years. And every time we spin our wheels and it's, you know, the hard work, the smart work, the time, the resources are wasted, you know, you know, being in this machine versus actually solving the problem because, nobody's thinking investing right in a longer term and then trusting the researchers and the scientists and the technologists and the the experts to actually get you there um and i i'm i i think this is this is part of i honestly raising awareness so we have to abide by the criteria because you know even my kids still have to take tests even though i think they're amazing right but at the same time i think the world is changing and i think we're all evolving the criteria. I mean, we're evolving the criteria for government contracts. And I hear NSF, when we had a similar event, I think last year, also talking about maybe we need to rethink how we do grants for the long term. So I think this is part of a dialogue. But to me, the lesson here is just don't take things for granted. Oh, this is the criteria and I have to meet you know, all of it and the way they want me to. There could be a give and take. And if not, you raise the issue and create a conversation around it because you could influence the criteria for the next one or maybe even you. Harry, do you have anything to add? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, so <laughs> I'd like to echo a couple of points uh, that nothing already mentioned, right? So uh, the trend is definitely changing, right? So um, Funding agencies like National Science Foundation and uh, National Institute of Health are already recognizing this. So if you look at the last two, three years, they have been most of the newer mechanisms have been focused on the future, not the present. So they are opening up new opportunities like expeditions in computing, right? So that's very open-ended. They want researchers to think about next 10 years. They don't want to think about next two years, right? So the proposal itself is intended towards what is the future, not what is present or just solving the problems of the present. So that is definitely changing. Um, the second point I want to add um, on that Nadine already mentioned is influencing uh, the metric itself, right? So, so the success criteria is predefined in many of this process, whether it's paper acceptance or funding proposals and whatnot. So you always get this rubric where you have to make a particular score on the rubric to get funding or get accepted in the paper. And even if you make the score, you are you have a cutoff on how many people already made it. And then you go by the ascending order and say, okay, only 10 people get this, right? So there's always this practical limitations to what can be done in, in accepting a paper or actually funding a project or a proposal. And that's that's more of a practical limitation, right? So, so if I have to think of uh, success as getting an NSF funding, that's always difficult, right? So my success is getting the project done and funding is one way or one of the important step in getting the project done, but it is not the only success criteria in getting the project done, right? So if NSF has like a cutoff of 10% acceptance in that particular solicitation, so if my proposal doesn't make within the top 10% of that particular solicitation, doesn't mean my project did not succeed. It just one of the step did not uh, occur in that particular time moment, right? So I still have lots of other opportunities, lots of other solicitation that I can still shoot to. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. And influencing the metric itself is still an option for all of us, right? So as soon as I realized what was happening, um, I, I got succeeded in few proposals. I got um, not succeeded, quote unquote, uh, in few proposal. So I started asking what is happening. And then uh, I wanted to understand the process itself. So I volunteered myself as a reviewer to understand how they make decisions, to understand why this is not happening, right? So to justify why my proposal was not done, rather than regretting that it is not happening, I need to understand the process itself, right? So we all have this opportunity to understand from the other angle, sitting from the other side of the table, 
how do people evaluate a proposal to understand okay so this is what has happened it's it's just a practical limitation they like your proposal but it's just they don't have enough funding to fund you at this point of time right so that's a diff- completely different perspective i got when i started reviewing proposals myself yeah of course yeah but of course proposal is just an example and resources are always limited so if someone well i i'm going to use the word fail but that doesn't mean that's a failure proposal uh, is not good it's just that resources are limited and there are perhaps better fit proposals but but of course we also should remind ourselves that you know for something like proposal is an input but it's very very important input i just want to ask another question which is really nice about um the 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 kind of conflict of commitment and very rapidly changing landscape in research um this is basically says um obviously this can take months or years given the rapid growth of today's very large hype cycle one may have to survive on um not very po- not very popular topic for years that that is quite a big decision um sh- well of course landscape is changing there are new technologies um and we might be interested in trying them but they're changing every day um if for a certain cycle we don't like the thing that we have well we can continue doing what we like but that also means we won't have the same impact maybe not necessarily because uh, the the kind of technology landscape have moved on let's say if you you are still interested in something that no longer exists um how you balance that question of commitment basically um that we have had and also the very rapid changing landscape of data can we start with you vanessa yeah actually it's interesting that i am the first one to answer that because basically we are writing a research grant here and it's the type of grant that you need to collaborate with the local council and they have certain needs here uh, for what needs to be done with the data from the data science side of things is something that's pretty much like sorted and solved it's just like replicating methods and applying and basically what we decided to do is like well we are shaping the proposal in a way that they get what they need but we still get the science part that we want out of it so i think that's the kind of whole trick on trying to kind of ride this very kind of hype cycles like you still kind of fit what you want to do i know it's not like always possible but i think that's the best strategy to link what you're doing with something that's relevant now so that you can like really sell it because that's what we are trying to do when we write a proposal we're selling our ideas and telling them why it's so amazing that like <laughs> martin tomko once said to me like you need to make them think that like If you don't give me the money to do that, the cat is going to die. <laughs> that's the word he uses. So that's the kind of idea we're trying to sell. So you really need to make it relevant and part of it is in part of the job of being a researcher, being an academic is and also in industry is adapting. So we need to adapt to the landscape as much as we can. Uh I think that would be my my take on it like do what you can adapt your research but still fit what you love doing that's actually relevant to that side okay nothing with chat do you go do you adapt um or keep your uh, commitment and loyalty to the subject that you like if there is a balance what is um, your decision making process uh so this is another hard question uh but uh I was thinking it's not about um uh, because I like a topic I think it's it's the impact going what Harry was 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 talking about right so I think honestly if I'm passionate about the impact that I want to make it's very hard to then adapt like if I'm passionate about the oceans right now you want me to do underground infrastructure no right the <laughs> um um so i think sometimes it's uh it's maybe it's a moment to think what am i really passionate about here 
is it you know uh, you know how can i fit the impacts if i'm i'm how, can i fit the science into this other science and i can link things to each other can i reuse the technology but i'm not a fan of you know pivoting because you go to the extreme and then that's all become you know real estate or bitcoin or whatever because this is where the money is right it could get very extreme so i would i would say stay true because if it's your passion is true and there's a problem you're not just making things up right <laughs> uh, there's actually a problem there and you know fight for it uh, and maybe open the eyes of other people i think collaboration really helps right like the way vanessa was describing it and finding where your problem i think fits into these other funding opportunities because they may not know they may be talking i don't know digital twins and you're doing oceans and it's just, it really fits i know i'm oversimplifying but i that's the balance to me i think stick to your passion and find ways because uh, you you can't be the only one you're not crazy right no, <laughs> there has to be other people yeah absolutely i think this is always a question balancing between blue sky research and applied research interdisciplinary or very deep and focused um it, it's always that sort of balance i think that's the whole uh way of science proceeding so harry how do you describe your balance between um you know dedication and commitment as opposed to the changing landscape and trying new things yeah so i think it's, it's a dilemma pretty much all of us have at some point in our life right so whether we, we we need to make money for for our protein mundane stuff to survive and also we need to do the things that we like uh, for the passion of doing science right so which is really what currently not so popular right so the idea of doing science for the sake of science has been diminishing for a while now because everybody's uh, more problem driven or solution driven so people want to solve world problem immediately or within the next 2 3 years um, so nobody or at least the idea of doing science just for the sake of science has has came down a lot right so um but that's the challenge too right so i i had this dilemma too right so at 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 a certain point i realized um i'm i've been too much involved in the company's day to day aspect doing administrative stuff doing research specifically for that problem space and i realized um uh, as long as i'm doing it within the company I, i won't have that um openness i'll always be subjected to the company so i needed to look at it in a different angle so i pursued the opportunity to join an academic institution to do that an open research right not targeted towards solving a dedicated problem area which is more targeted so i wanted to have that science for the sake of science so so you do have that option to open yourself to more opportunities and balance your life in a particular way so you have your study stream funding op- option for your everyday thing as well as doing things for your passion so if you if you can balance your life and commit time to different things you can make it happen uh, but it's it's your individual level of commitment that you want to take in in different point of time okay so talking about the balance um Uh, there is a very good question again from Johannes that says um how do you balance work and life actually so um we are you know generally not very good at uh, balancing work life uh, balance and uh, very briefly i want you to just give us very concrete examples and of workable practices that you have used to balance your work and personal life Sorry, I didn't say anything. Nadine, can you start with you? You you talked already about your children and you know so so that would be good to start with you. Yeah, uh I don't know uh it's a, 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 why are all the questions so difficult? <laughs> it's very difficult I think because the balance is just life overall. Uh but I'll give you a concrete example because you asked for one. Uh, uh exercising to me right it's very very important and there are always a million excuses you know my kids i'm tired my job i have a meeting i'm traveling whatever so the way i force myself is actually i certified and i have my own studio it's like an aerobics it's a jazzercise dance studio it forces me to show up there right because i have students uh depending on me actually showing up and teaching the class and magically then it fits into your schedule because it's now literally on your schedule and that helps a lot 
So being accountable, I think, to other people sometimes helps you be accountable for yourself. So that's just as an example. Yeah, for the kids, fine. when I... <laughs> when I figure it out, I'll let you know. I I haven't figured it out. I just we all are learning. We all <laughs> are learning. I think, but but finding time and putting and making commitment to actually balance it is a good example. Um, yeah. Vanessa, yeah. how do you balance between personal life and work life? Uh, I remove my email app from my phone for starters. <laughs> Because I, uh, if I have it on, I check my emails 24-7. Even if, I, if it, I am in bed, if I am having lunch, if I, doesn't matter. I might be at the movies and I was like, I'll just check it for a second. And then all of a sudden, your work is just taking over your weekend. And then the, the movie session that was supposed to be nice and then you're stressed about some email of a student that like it's in the middle of a crisis and like because of the assessment. So... That's a policy that I started. I only install it if I'm traveling or on a conference because I need it. I get back, I remove it. I, I don't have it. I turn off the notifications. That's one thing. And I always try to have something fun or that I really like uh, on the weekend on, or on some free time. And for me, something really important is sunshine. That's one of the reasons why I moved from Scotland. <laughs> Uh, so every time there is sunshine, I make sure to make the most of it, even if it's like a 30 minute walk in the middle of my day, because it really lifts my mood. So it's about, again, I think that balance of knowing what you need might be exercise, might be family time, might be, you know, three pieces of chocolate someday. It's about like getting what you really need to feel okay, happy and get through it. Okay. And um, very quickly, Harry, what do you think? Yeah, so it's, it's scheduling and balancing is something we all try to we, are, we constantly figure out things, right? So it's it's a continuing process in in our life. Uh, for me, it's it's two different jobs, and I have two little ones, two year old and a one year old. So so time commitment for each of those parts of my life is very important to me, right? So and time commitment for, for myself is also very important for me. Um, so I try to block times, right? So. I don't schedule anything before 10 a.m., right? So morning time is my time. I don't typically do anything. And then I delegate like one night for myself. So Friday night is my night. I won't commit anything to anyone, right? So I, I keep that block for myself. And then evening five to eight is kids time. So I don't schedule anything or do, I don't work within the time block because I make sure I'm with the kids during that time. And then same with my family, right? So I, I dedicate time. Um, I, I try to always commit to travel before. Right, so we'll make travel plans to make sure we have the dedicated time for the family. And during those times, I'll block off everything. Like what Vanessa said, I won't look at the emails. I won't look at any of the office commitments or anything. I'll say, I'm going on trip. I'm going on a vacation. So I won't do that. And I try to balance it every month, a weekend, and then every three months, a long weekend. So we have to force ourselves to do that at some point. And sometimes committing by actually making the travel plan, you're forcing yourself. But taking that initiation is more important. Okay, thank you very much. I see there is a very um, good support for chocolate break, which as a big fan of chocolates, I, I, I must say that, you know, I'm a very, very um, positive plus two on this. Um, so we are basically at the end, the last few minutes. So if you want to just say one point from this discussion that you think the uh, early career researchers should bring themselves and put it, you know, golden written somewhere to just always look at it. Uh, what is the most important point that was mentioned today? And I think you you, you believe that should be all the time with the um, researcher. Vanessa, very quickly. Learn to say yes to then be able to say no. <laughs> okay. Um, Nadine, what is your take? Don't doubt yourself. Don't doubt yourself. And Harry, what is your final point? Define your own success. 
define your own success. Okay, so I think we, we basically uh, finished very, very sharp on time. So um, I don't know about you, but in Team Glasgow, we've got good lunch now ready for us. Um, so I hope you also have got, well, but I, I guess our panelists either will have dinner or breakfast. We, we were really unfair to them. Thank you very much for your comments, for your suggestions. Um, we are really looking forward to uh, hearing about uh, the success of our early career researchers. So in the next few years, we'll bring others. Um, so um, thank you. We really appreciate um, it's not very the most important um, part of your uh, career to advise others, but it, mentorship always, always uh, return uh, in some way or another. Um, have a lovely break. I think I'll see you the rest of the um, audience um, soon, but I, I presume some of you are going to sleep. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.